now after we have discussed a very simple problem with the with how contact actually works for a one dimensional case uh, with the sudden increase in stiffness uh, i would like to discuss with you how exactly is contact taken into account in a finite element analysis problem now if you uh, recall then the finite element analysis problem is generally set up or the equilibrium equation is generally set up by means of the principle of virtual work for the structure and in that case we look at the total potential energy pi which is given as the strain energy minus the external work done in the system now the conditions for the strain energy of course will remain the same because they depend upon the stress and strain of the body and, uh, and you have contributions of the body forces and the surface forces which come into the external work done and this is exactly where the contribution also for the contact force goes in. Now apart from the usual description of the strain energy and the work done uh, which is for the external forces applied the contribution of the contact forces is also added in in this way. Now the contribution of the contact forces, so let me just write over here separately the contribution of contact, you can also write this as tractions or contact forces, can be written for n bodies that are in contact, that are involved let's say in the contact definition, can be given as a summation of number of bodies 1 to n integral of the displacement which happens due to contact at a certain location with the force which is a contact force at a certain location at a given time at a surface area or a surface location given as ds or length of the surface so this defines completely now the traction forces due to the contact which are added into the total potential energy of the problem. And of course the rest of the story is already known to you as to how we go about solving this to get the equilibrium equation. But this is the way in which the equilibrium, uh, in which the equilibrium equation actually is uh, changed because of the presence of contact. Now there's always going to, if you remember carefully, there's always going to be two surfaces that come in contact with each other and there will always be a surface force that will act. So if I look at two bodies that are hypothetically in contact with each other at a certain distance given over here and over here for the two objects, then we know that there will be a force which will act on both the bodies over here. Of course, I'm just drawing it eccentric, but they should come in contact exactly at this point and this point, which should be matching. And here I will have a force which will be given by body 1 to body 2, if this is body 1, this body 2. And this one will be body 2 to body 1. And you will have the surface which is defined over here, over this length. So clearly, you would be able to define the total contact forces or the total contribution of the contact forces by adding both the contributions of the force from one surface and the force from the other surface. So of course you know the, the vectors are opposite and therefore they should be equal, they should be of course negative one on po one positive and the other one is negative. So you would be able to use the contribution of both the contact forces uh, to define how the equilibrium equation will be changed. Now generally the two surfaces that are going to come in contact with each other are called contact surface pairs. And this is a standard way of defining contact surfaces in a, in a commercial finite element program. Now back when commercial finite element programs did not have the definition of contact, of course people use these uh, definitions as I've shown you before in the terms of springs. And to take care of the initial behavior where there was a lot of oscillations etc, you could also use a dampener. Uh, in uh, parallel to the spring so as to reduce um, problems that were not related to overclosure but were related to bouncing. Of course there was a lot of effort that went into deciding what should be the stiffness of the uh, sudden change in stiffness when the contact happens. Uh, you could not make it infinite because you could end up with singularities or forces would be too high but you had to come up with a good value of the stiffness that would not 
negatively affect your uh, structures, uh, performance or results yeah, of what you would see out of it. But now coming back to the definition of um, the contact problem within the context of the finite element analysis, I would not like to go more into details uh, than this. However, I would like to continue in the next video about how we uh, define a contact using normal contact as well as tangential contact using a frictional uh, component as well. Now let us consider a condition when two objects are coming into contact with each other and we want to find out uh, what is the composition of the contact traction vector that we have shown to you in the previous video. Right, so we can in that case start with um, decomposing the contact traction or the contact force vector into components. So we can write here that the force F, which was given as FC, let's say, or F for contact, can be written as lambda n plus s uh, plus t s. Now lambda and t here are the important parts. So lambda is the normal traction component and the t is the tangential traction component. n of course is the uh, uh, vector for uh, normal, the normal vector and s of course is the distance over which the tangential uh, component is acting and to define these values we need to know the actual position of the point that is going to come in contact between the two different objects so that is something we need to iterate for or search for during the analysis now uh, let's say that we consider first the normal definition now in a, in a normal definition first now let us consider that you have two bodies which are going to be, um, which are coming in contact with each other, okay? Now this is body two and this is body one and this is the normal vector and this is the tangential vector yeah, for, the for the direction. Now the, surf the point, uh, if this is moving upwards, then we can assume that there will be a point over here which is going to come in contact with the point on the body one in, which is uh, given by these yellow dots. Now, at the point which is present on uh, the body one, we can decompose the force now into the normal vector, which is lambda n, and into the tangential, which is given as Ts. So this is basically the definition of how the contact analysis will be uh, resolved into the normal as well as the tangential parts. Now let's look again at the normal uh, contact in a little bit more uh, details. Now we can say that if there is a gap function, yeah, if, I, if I define a gap function given as G, then conditions for normal contact, so I must state some conditions. So contact, normal contact can only happen under these certain conditions that the gap function should be greater than or equal to zero. The lambda, which is the normal uh, force, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And in order to keep this uh, consistent, there has to be g times lambda is equal to zero. And this equation expresses the fact that if g is greater than zero, then lambda must be equal to zero and vice versa. Okay, so you can always say that if this is g and this is lambda, then we will always have lambda is equal to zero when g is greater than zero and lambda is equal to, and g is equal to zero when lambda is equal to zero. Okay, that would come from the conditions of, let this way for the uh, com for the conditions for normal contact to happen now if we would like to include the friction then let's assume uh, just taking into account friction with the coulomb friction law which is a very simple uh, law but you can also of course in software uh, use other kinds of laws but i'm just going to make use of the simplest one possible 
and according to the Coulomb friction law, I'm going to take mu as the coefficient of friction. Now, of course, that also uh, that should help us understand that it has to come into play when you have the traction. Uh, sorry, when you have the uh, tangential force. So we are going to define a dimensionless variable given as tau to be equal to the tangential component, which is given by t divided by which is given by coefficient of friction times lambda, where mu lambda is corresponds to a frictionless resi frictional resistance. Okay, this frictional resistance is going to uh, it will become clear once I define exactly what this non-dimensional variable tau stands for. If there has to be, of course, if there is a co coefficient of friction, then there has to be a frictional resistance, which comes from mu times lambda, which means that at any point, the tau should always be less than equal to 1. Now, if the tau is greater than, uh, sorry, is less than 1, then we can say that there is no motion. Yeah, there is no velocity that happens at a certain point, no, uh, no change in location. Now at the same time when tau is equal to 1 then you do have motion that means the relative velocity has a certain value other than 0. So if I want to put it graphically you say if I have this is the velocity yeah the relative velocity and the non-dimensional um, parameter tau then when u is equal to 0 of course then tau is less than uh, 1. That means it stays somewhere over here when this is given as 1 and then when tau is equal to 1 then it can slide in this direction. So this can also be called as stick and this can be called as slip conditions in friction, uh, in frictional analysis. So this is how you would also take into account the Coulomb friction. And where does this all go in? This, of course, goes into the, com the com complete frictional, uh, sorry, the complete contact force vector, which ultimately goes back into the work done due to the external forces, which forms the equilibrium equation and can be solved iteratively to get a final result for your problem after convergence.